preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, good evening, and welcome to our Human Mind series. My name is Susan Engel, and I direct the Adult Division in the Center for Adult Life and Learning. I'm so glad to see so many of you with us this evening. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to bring your attention to a brochure you've just received. In addition to a fascinating array of lectures and stimulating interviews, what many of you might not know is that the Y also offers many classes in personal growth, human development, and support groups. So I encourage you to take a look at some of those offerings as well. And now for tonight. The topic this evening is the language instinct, how the mind creates the gift of language. Our guest is the author of a book by that title that has captured the attention and imagination of thousands of readers nationwide. Steven Pinker is considered one of the greatest thinkers in the field of linguistics, and he is able to explain in understandable terms what scientists know about human beings as language users. Thanks to his clear and entertaining style, we have gained a better comprehension of how people articulate and understand speech, how babies learn to talk, how our linguistic machinery is coded in the genes and wired in the brain, and how language fits into human evolution. Dr. Pinker is currently professor and co-director of the Center for Cognitive Science at MIT. After his talk, he will be delighted to answer any of your questions. And then please join us in the adjacent art gallery for a book selling and signing. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Steven Pinker. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Language comes so naturally to us that we're apt to forget the complexity behind it. We're kind of like the kids who, uh, when they're asked where does milk come from, they say from a truck and leave it at that. But um, I'd like to begin just by reminding you of the biological miracle that human language is. What are we all doing here? You're all sitting in a chair, you've paid money, you've come out of your home uh, to do what? to sit here while a guy on a stage opens his mouth and goes blah, 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 makes noise. I'm going to make noise while I exhale, but you're willing to listen to those noises for uh, the next 50 minutes or so. Uh, the reason that you're willing to do this is because there's something very special about those noises. Because of tiny little details, the way I uh, move my tongue up and down, I'm able to cause you to think very precise combinations of ideas. Now those ideas are going to be about language itself, but uh, with, by making slightly different noises, I could just as easily be instructing you on the sex life of the octopus, or how to build a thermonuclear device in your basement, or the latest twists and turns of the OJ trial, and so on. The miracle of language is how, just with minor uh, modulations of a signal, we are able to do almost the equivalent of uh, mental telepathy. I'm going to talk about what I think language is, what I think language isn't, how language works, and the future of language and, and languages. And I'll, I'll start off with what I think language is. Um, recently, there in a, um, I read a, in a question and answer column in a San Francisco newspaper, and someone wrote in and said, what is man's greatest invention? And the uh, answer was, well, it's a trade-off between agriculture, the wheel, fire, and language. Now, I think this answer is deeply wrong, that language doesn't belong together with things that someone invented in some point in history and then uh, had it transmitted uh, ever since from culture to culture, in which each individual acquires in uh, uh, one's lifetime. But it belongs more in the category of how spiders spin webs, how bats find insects in pitch blackness using sonar, uh, and other uh, species-typical uh, capabilities in the animal kingdom. Uh, and that, I call that an instinct. 
Uh, and the term actually comes from Darwin, who said, man has an instinctive tendency to speak, as we see in the babble of our young children, while no child has an instinctive tendency to bake, brew, or write. Now, why do uh, I think he got it spot on? Why do I think that language is a, a human instinct? Well, to begin with, uh, language is universal. This is a uh, discovery made really in the, uh, thanks to anthropologists at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, who found not only that uh, no human culture, no human tribe or people lacks language, but that uh, there is no such thing as a uh, primitive or simple language. There are cultures that one could call Stone Age on the basis of their technology, but there's no such thing as a Stone Age language. Indeed, many of the uh, languages of non-literate, non-industrial peoples have grammars that are more complex and more elegant than the familiar European languages of Greek, Latin, English, French. Just to give you uh, one of my favorite examples, the uh, Cherokee language has different pronouns for we, depending on whether we means me and you, the person I'm speaking to, me and some third party, but not including you, the person I'm speaking to, me and several of you, me, you, and at least one other person, me and several of you, and at least one other person, and so on. Now, English, by comparison, is a primitive language, as are all the languages of Europe, because we have to make do with the single pronoun we, leaving this ambiguous. Moreover, even within a society, the, you find complex language in all individuals. Uh, people are surprised to hear this because there is, I think, a, a universal human tendency to think that the uh, dialect or language spoken by someone other than you must be uh, a coarse, broken, corrupt version of what you speak. But um, it's uh, a commonplace in linguistics that so-called, that the non-standard versions of English have their own systematic grammars uh, that uh, can express things that the standard can't and vice versa. Things like the, the double negative, I can't get no satisfaction, for example, which your English teacher may have told you is a, uh, actually means the opposite of what it says because two negatives cancel out and make a positive. Forget about that. Uh, if that were true, then it would be impossible for any French speaker to uh, utter a negation because, of course, in French you also have two elements, ne and pas, that are used to express negation. In fact, the standard English equivalent, I can't get any satisfaction really is just a minor uh, variant where any basically means no. It's simply a slightly different grammatical rule to express the same concept. And in uh, dialects like um, Black English, there are rules that uh, one doesn't find in Standard English, and in fact, concepts that can't be expressed as easily. The difference between uh, he working and he be working is a systematic uh, rule that pertains to the difference between someone who merely has a job and someone who is working at the very moment that the sentence is uttered, a distinction that Standard English grammar has no means of making. There's also a standard design to human languages all over the planet what Noam Chomsky called the universal grammar. So take Japanese, for example. Japanese has no historical connection to English, or for that matter, to any other language, uh, as far as we know. Um, and Japanese is obviously different from English. You get off a plane in, in uh, Tokyo, and you don't understand a word they say. So you're, we tend to be very impressed by the differences between languages. But how does Japanese differ from English? Well, one example is that in English, we have the order subject, verb, object. John ate the apple. In Japanese, there's the order subject, object, verb. John the apple ate. But the remarkable thing is that you can find things like subjects, verbs, and objects in languages as uh, historically separate as English and Japanese. And all over the world, languages are built out of the same pieces. The uh, nouns and verbs, the subjects and objects, the cases, the auxiliaries, the tenses, and so on. So you see the same machinery. One gets a, a real sense that language is an instinct, as Darwin pointed out, by noting how, um, how it develops in the individual child. Uh, as Darwin uh, noted, it's the babble of our young children that uh, especially strikes us. Children 
uh, basically learn how to use their speech apparatus some, by babbling and listening to their own babble around five or six months of age. Around uh, a year, they start producing their first words. Around uh, 18 months, they start to combine them in micro sentences like um, hi doggy, all gone milk, uh, uh, more Batman, and so on. Uh, in their third year of life, in their twos, there is an explosion of grammatical complexity in the, in the spontaneous speech of the child to the point where after several months, uh, the child is speaking fluently in full sentences that um, obey most of the grammatical rules of uh, spoken English that contain most of the grammatical constructions of spoken English. And if that's, as any parent knows, children are actually quite good at using language to uh, express their opinions and demands and so on. Uh, when you think about what the child has done, it becomes uh, particularly remarkable. The child doesn't have, hasn't gotten lessons, uh, doesn't have to buy tapes, conjugate verbs, go to night school, uh, sit through those language labs that we all remember from high school. But nonetheless, in uh, a year and a half, the child is doing things like remembering whether to put an S on the verb to get it to agree with the subject. He walks versus they walk. A three and a half year old obeys that rule more than 90% of the time. It doesn't help him get any more cookies. It doesn't help him get anything in life. All it does is it conforms to the grammatical pattern of English and children do it without being able to help it. Even children's errors are uh, remarkable not because they are errors. What's remarkable about them is uh, why they should sound like errors to adult ears at all. If you take an error like, uh, we holded the baby rabbits, the mystery there is not why the child said holded. The mystery is why we don't say hold it. If the past tense of fold is folded, why shouldn't the past tense of hold be holded? Um, children say things like, don't giggle me, don't make me giggle. If you can bounce a ball and a ball can bounce, then if a child can giggle, why can't you giggle a child? I'll leave these as imponderables for, the, uh, for you to figure out. But the child is really a grammatical genius with a very acute sensitivity to the grammatical structure of the uh, language. Any language, by the way. Um, things that, that drove you crazy in high school, like memorizing all those you know, case endings for German and the grammatical classes of French, trust me, are pose no problem for the German child or for the French child. If they did, of course, the French or German language would have changed a long time ago. Now, the children's uh, genius at ferreting out the grammatical regularities of their language can be, um, leads me to talk about children not so much learning a language as recreating it every generation. This recreation is often hidden from us because there is a confounded variable, namely parents speak English, child ends up speaking English. It looks like the child is simply reproducing what, the, what they hear from parents. But there are some special circumstances in which we can see that children really deserve the credit for creating a language, and those come in cases where children, the input that children get doesn't consist of a pre-existing language, and what children will do is they'll go out and they'll invent one. There are two cases, um, that, two well-documented cases. In a um, number of points in history, there have been groups of people, usually in slave colonies or uh, plantations, where uh, a babel of, uh, of languages was thrown together, say slaves from different uh, p uh, tribes in Africa or indentured servants from different parts of the world. And uh, when that happens, adults develop a makeshift communication system just to uh, get through the tasks of day-to-day -day living. Kind of what you or I would do if we were on the streets of Rome and knew just a few words of Italian from a phrase book. We'd try to string them together in the hope that uh, a charitable listener would know what we were talking about. This kind of system called a, a pigeon, um, P-I-D-G-I-N, uh, becomes the lingua franca of the community and that's what children have to uh, acquire to be able to communicate with the community as a whole. But the children never reproduce the pigeon. They turn it into a complex language called a creole with its own uh, grammar, its rules for ordering subject, verb, and object, ways of expressing tense and modality and negation, ways of forming questions that are uniform across the community of children and uh, 
to a linguist just look like uh, any other language. Now, these cases have all been reconstructed from uh, historical record because, fortunately, there aren't any more colonies of indentured servants or slaves. Uh, but the, the retroactive uh, observation that it was children that create the Creole languages uh, has recently been confirmed by a very interesting study going on right now in uh, Nicaragua by uh, the linguist uh, Judy Cagle and uh, a graduate student of mine, Annie Senghas. And it concerns a community of deaf children. Now, uh, sign, the sign languages for the deaf are not charades or pantomimes or systems of gestures. From the point of view of a linguist, they are languages with their own rules of grammar, their arbitrary signs, and so on. There was no indigenous sign language in Nicaragua until uh, at the time when the first schools for the deaf were formed around 1980. The children were thrown together uh, and the school was an oralist school. They fitted the children with hearing aids, tried, them to, get, tried to get them to master lip reading and speech, which um, uh, almost never works if uh, deaf people have access to a sign language. That's the medium that they uh, prefer to use. But there wasn't any in this particular case. The children, the older children, uh, to communicate with one another in the school buses and the playgrounds would use some of the gestures that they had, were forced to use with their own hearing parents, and gradually this set of gestures was pooled to form the equivalent of a pigeon. The interesting thing is that the younger children in the school, the ones that were six, seven, eight, nine, turned this pigeon sign system into a very different form that was far more expressive, far more fluent, had consistent rules of grammar, and that in fact has now become the standard among the deaf community in Nicaragua, and the older children are learning it from the younger ones. Uh, it's, in, it's interesting to see, in fact, the contrast between what the children are having drilled into them in the school and uh, the language they've created themselves. They sit there in class every day, and the teacher uh, stares at them and says, repeat, Como se llama? And meanwhile, as soon as the kids get out of school, they're saying, hey, you owe me an apple. I traded an apple for a peanut butter sandwich two weeks ago, and it's uh, time you paid me back, and expressing very complex thoughts uh, such as that. Now, uh, I've been talking about how humans can't help but use language, but the question is, is this simply a manifestation of our general intelligence, just one of the many things that we do with the, this uh, general purpose computer that we have on our shoulders? Uh, or is there a special instinct for language, a, a faculty or a mental organ, so to speak? I think there's uh, increasing evidence that language is a special faculty of the mind. It's not just a, a one more smart thing that we do. You can see language and the rest of intelligence uh, dissociate, come apart in special conditions of pathology. In aphasia, for example, where a person uh, suffers damage to the left parasylvian areas of the, uh, the brain, you can have extreme difficulty speaking or understanding complex sentences, but with preserved intelligence in other domains. People clearly know what's going on, know what's happened to them, can do anything that doesn't require language, test normally in the nonverbal parts of IQ test, they've lost the, the faculty of articulate speech. Sometimes this happens without any uh, observable physical cause. There are some children who grow up with, uh, with, with their language developing late and with it being a struggle for them all their lives, simply to get sentences out and to obey the uh, rules of English. When uh, This is called a specific language impairment, which is a highfalutin name for uh, the fact that these children don't have language and their deficit seems specific to it. Uh, no one really knows what causes it, but there's a suspicion that it's genetic because specific language impairment uh, runs in families and is highly concordant in monozygotic twins, much more so than in dizygotic twins. Now, these, are ca these two cases, aphasia and specific language impairment, are both cases where you've got someone uh, unable to speak or understand, but performing uh, intelligently in other ways. 
And you might say, well, maybe that just shows that language is the most intellectually demanding thing that we do. And if your brain isn't running on all eight cylinders, language is just the thing that suffers the most, the first thing to go. So to really clinch the case, you want the equivalent of a linguistic idiot savant, someone who is uh, syndromes where the language is fine, but the rest of intelligence suffers. That's a way of teasing apart quantity and quality. In fact, there are a number of syndromes where that can happen. Uh, speech pathologists sometimes call them uh, chatterbox syndromes, where a severely retarded child will nonetheless talk a blue streak in uh, completely uh, in, in perfect English. That can happen in the rare condition of retardation called Williams syndrome, uh, a genetic condition where the IQ is 50, but the children are extremely sociable and uh, excellent conversationalists. It can also happen in some cases of hydrocephalus ca caused by spina bifida, where children will really can um, go on and on um, recounting stories that never in fact happened, and only uh, after they are tested or when you speak to the parents or a clinician do you even realize that the child is retarded. So that's um, uh, an uh, overview of the uh, evidence that language is uh, an adaptation of Homo sapiens, not something that uh, was invented by a particular genius in historical times and then passed on by uh, cultural transmission. Um, what about what language isn't? Well, there are, I'm going to talk about three things that I think uh, should be kept separate from uh, this remarkable ability called language. One of them is reading and writing oddly enough. Uh, written language was invented at a particular time in history, uh, uh, four, four to 5,000 years ago. Uh, alphabetic writing, where each character corresponds to a sound in the language as opposed to a word in the language, was invented even more recently by the Canaanites and uh, indeed was invented only by the Canaanites. All alphabetic writing systems on the planet now are direct historical descendants of that original system. Uh, reading and writing, unlike language, do have to be taught. You do need lessons. You have to go to school. You've got to work hard. You've got to have it drilled into you. And un again, unlike language, uh, reading and writing aren't always acquired successfully. Uh, a large percentage of the population, probably about 10%, uh, never masters the ability to read fluently. They're uh, dyslexics who, dyslexic who are, and they're obviously, um, by definition, intellectually normal in other spheres. It's just that this peculiar invention of getting scratches on a paper to correspond to sounds of a language is not something that, in general, our brains were prepared to do. A second thing that language isn't. Language isn't the prescriptive grammar of the uh, school marm and copy editor and Sunday language columnist, the uh, set of rules on how one ought to talk. Now, these are things like don't split infinitives, don't end a sentence with a preposition, uh, don't ever use hopefully to mean it is to be hoped that, um, and all the other rules that you've forgotten from your uh, elementary school days. Now, what is the, where, where do these... Um, injunctions come from? Why are we, uh, whenever I say to someone, I study language, why is their reaction always, oh, I better make sure I'm not making a grammatical error? How could this be if my, what I deeply believe is that uh, we are all biologically equipped for grammar? If we're all biologically equipped for grammar, why does the English language seem to be in such a mess? Well, there are really three things that are going on when you try to boss people around in terms of how they talk. One of them is there are many dialects of English. The English language is a bit of a, uh, a myth. There always have been many dialects of English. One of them happened to be spoken in London in the 17th century, around the time that uh, the British Empire started to expand. The government, central government got more powerful. That dialect of English became the standard of government and education and later science, uh, the media, and so on. That particular dialect is called standard English. There is uh, no, in, in most cases, there is nothing inherently better about standard English than the various dialects spoken in the British Isles and the United States that are not standard. I gave the example of the difference between I can't get no satisfaction uh, and I can't get any satisfaction. Other things like the difference between ask and axe, 
uh, drag, uh, drug him away, dragged him away, them books, those books, and so on, are really just like the differences between English and Dutch, only a, a little less extreme. Now, by the way, I, I, just to be understood, this doesn't mean that people in a society shouldn't learn the standard. Um, I think uh, every educated person should know how to speak and write in standard English, <clears throat> as opposed to black English, rural American English, and so on, uh, for the same reason that I think uh, every person should learn English and not, say, Dutch. Standard English is the standard, a little less standard, in the same sense that 110 volts coming out of the wall is standard, driving on the right as opposed to driving on the left is uh, standard, and it's good for everyone to have a common system to use in formal written contexts. Uh, it's just that one should keep in mind what that means. It doesn't mean that, that uh, Larry Bird spoke fractured syntax, uh, broken English, ignorant violations of rules. He just happened to be the linguistic descendant of speakers in a part of England who are unlucky enough not to have been in London in the 17th century. The second uh, aspect of um, prescriptive grammar is bits of folklore that originated for cockamamie reasons several hundred years ago, uh, found their way into the grammar books, and have been perpetuated ever since by the same dynamic that leads to college fraternity hazing. Namely, I had to suffer through it, and I'm none the worse. Why should you have it any easier? Uh, these are the, the silly little rules that all the great writers of English have always flouted. Um, things like the uh, so-called split infinitive. Uh, according to defenders of the rule against split infinitives, one should not say that the five-year mission of the uh, Starship Enterprise is to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, and to boldly go where no man has gone before. It should be to go boldly where no man has gone before. To which I say, beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. <laughs> the rule against splitting infinitives comes from a, um, a literal-minded extension of the grammar of Latin, uh, thought to be the world's ideal language. Uh, and in Latin, it is um, the infinitive is a single word. Julius Caesar couldn't have split an infinitive if he had wanted to. And to force uh, modern English speakers to do that uh, really has no rhyme or reason. George Bernard Shaw, after uh, had, he had a uh, copy editor unsplit his infinitives, he wrote a letter to the head of the publishing house say, saying, it does not matter to me whether you force him quickly to go or whether you force him to go quickly or for, whether you force him to quickly go, just make him go. <laughs> Another example, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard, is that the uh, Winston Churchill's reaction to the rule against ending a sentence with a preposition this is the kind of pedantry up with which I shall not put. And as for the rule about hopefully, the idea is that um, if you ever say, hopefully the treaty will pass, then you have committed a grave barbarism, it is said. Because hopefully means in a manner filled with hope and should only be used when the subject of the sentence is actually acting in a hopeful manner. So it is wrong to say, hopefully the treaty will pass, you should only use it in contexts like, hopefully, Melvin turned the record over and sat back down on the couch 11 centimeters closer to Ellen. Or, <laughs> now, where, where did this come from? Uh, the claim that in English, adverbs only modify the, uh, the subject of the sentence is just wrong. Any student who said that in introductory syntax would get a failing grade. We've got dozens of adverbs that can modify either the entire sentence or the um, action performed by the subject of the sentence, or both. You can say things like, um, fortunately, the uh, treaty has passed, and that no one has said that the <coughs> treaty has to be passing in a fortunate manner. <coughs> Candidly, I think that this is a silly rule, and <laughs> frankly, I don't give a damn about it. Uh, now, there is a third aspect of uh, prescriptive grammar, and that is simply good prose style. Uh, I mentioned that writing is not a human instinct. Writing is, in many ways, very different from speaking. You don't have someone nodding when they understand and screwing up their face when they don't. Uh, you don't know the person you're talking to, so you've got to anticipate a generic reader. Uh, the words sit on the page as opposed to 
sort of flying by and being forgotten very quickly. And so writing well clearly does take practice, and there is a, an important role for the teaching of composition and prose and so on. But the thing is that very little of that has anything to do with <clears throat> these silly little rules of grammar. You can have god-awful prose. I've seen lots of it, being an academic, uh, looking at the writing of my uh, peers. You see it coming out of the government and so on. Um, none of the infinitives are split and so on, and it's awful for 57 other reasons. So I do think that one should pay attention to one's language, but to just be clear that uh, if uh, everyone is flouting a rule, maybe it's the rule that should be questioned and not the people. Um, okay, I said language is not reading and writing. Language is not uh, the uh, rules about how one ought to talk. A third thing that I'm going to argue that language is not is uh, thought. It's almost a commonplace of our age that, uh, our, that language uh, has a, um, a strong grip on our perception of reality, that uh, the, the uh, government acts in Orwellian ways to manipulate our minds by the way it uh, uh, describes things. Uh, we all can remember the Worfian hypothesis from uh, Introduction to Anthropology, the, the Eskimos with the 200 words for snow, the Hopi with no words for time. Uh, polyglots always love to impress you with uh, differences between languages that say something about national character. Isn't it significant, I've been told, that, the, that in German there is the word Schadenfreude, pleasure in another's misfortunes. Doesn't this say something very deep about the German psyche? Uh, now, and there are various other manifestations in, in literary criticism. Uh, the, this kind of thinking has gone uh, completely wild. Um, I think it's really um, uh, wrong. Uh, and here's why. I think that language is a way of getting a thought from one head to another by the channel of making noise with your mouth. I think it's not a way of having thoughts to begin with. Why not? Well, let me give you some, uh, some, some considerations. One of them is there are lots of, peop of creatures with no language who can clearly think. Uh, there's a, a, a <clears throat> large body of research in recent years testing um, nonverbal creatures like uh, non-human animals, monkeys, chimpanzees, uh, pre-linguistic infants, little babies before they've learned to talk, that using very ingenious experimental techniques have shown that monkeys, for example, and babies uh, have a good understanding of objects and the physical forces uh, with which they interact, human actors and their intentions, number, uh, perhaps even addition and subtraction. Even in uh, people with language, uh, normal adults uh, who are go around talking, there are many forms of thought that clearly don't involve words at all. Here's a question for all of you. What shape are a German shepherd's ears? Okay. Now, hmm? Well, they're pointy, right? Now, here's another question. How did you arrive at that answer? Is it because before you walked into the room, you had somewhere stored away in memory the fact that German shepherds have pointy ears? I mean, maybe. German shepherd lo lovers do, but then I'll just change the species. What shape are a cocker spaniel's ears? No, this isn't a kind of thinking that involves a, uh, the use of words at all. It involves uh, a mental image. It, the subjective experience is like forming some kind of picture and in some sense looking at the picture, to, uh, looking at the part of the dog that has the ears and seeing what their shape is. Uh, this subjective impression has been borne out, again, by ingenious laboratory studies of human mental imagery uh, that I won't go into. Um, adults, uh, deaf adults without sign language uh, and without spoken language can obviously uh, display many forms of complex thinking. Uh, fortunately, there are not many of them, but when they are studied, they can display uh, abilities that uh, require complex understanding of abstract concepts, for example, using money, which involves concepts such as obligation, exchange, and um, uh, symbolizations of resources. Or fixing a broken bicycle lock, which is another thing that um, 
in a, a study that I quote in the book, a uh, deaf adult without sign language has no trouble doing. Not only does this involve the sheer mechanical intelligence, how, how gears work, uh, I can't fix a broken bicycle lock, for example, but it also involves an understanding of human motives. What does it mean for a bicycle lock to be broken versus in working order? You don't just define it in terms of the movement of metal. A lock is broken if it fails to protect a piece of property against some other human who wants to take it away, and it works when that other malevolent person can't do so. Uh, again, returning to those of us with language, uh, we've all had expressive failures, cases where perhaps we start a sentence and listen to ourselves and realize that it wasn't what we meant and have to start over again with a different set of words, or sometimes get horribly frustrated, get writer's block, and can't find the words that express a thought. This, by the way, is the circumstance in which people coin new words, jargon, slang, technical terms, why, when you borrow from another language. When I just explained uh, the word schadenfreude to you, you did, if, those of you who didn't already know it didn't say, oh, my mind doesn't have that category because I've been speaking English all my life. You probably thought, how neat, I've always wanted uh, a word to express that concept. And of course, schadenfreude is now part of English, is used, uh, is used occasionally in writing. Now, I think this gets even um, more obvious when you look at language itself, and that's why the vast majority of linguists don't believe that uh, language determines thought. The problem is that language is a pretty lousy medium in which to couch thoughts. It's, there's no way that you could get a, say, a computer reasoning system in artificial intelligence to have its knowledge stored in the form of English sentences. For one thing, English is wildly ambiguous in ways that we don't realize, but that plague computer scientists. Uh, Mary had a little lamb, uh, according to the grammar of English, doesn't only mean that Mary possessed a little lamb. Uh, and this is clear when you imagine different ways you could follow up the sentence, like Mary had a little lamb with mint sauce, or <laughs> Mary had a little lamb and the doctors were really surprised, or <laughs> Mary had a little lamb, the tramp. <laughs> uh, Groucho Marx said, uh, I once shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got into my pajamas, I'll never know. <laughs> and uh, often these are, uh, are um, unintended, these ambiguities. Uh, there was a um, newspaper uh, clipping in the television section that said, uh, tonight Dr. Ruth will discuss sex with Dick Cavett. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Another, uh, another headline, uh, which is, um, was um, Bundy beats date with chair, about how uh, Ted Bundy managed to have his execution postponed. Now, what's the, I mean, so what? So language is ambiguous. What does that mean? Well, what does ambiguity mean? Ambiguity means that one set of words can have two meanings, two thoughts associated with it. The mere fact that language is ambiguous implies that there are these things called meanings or thoughts that are separate from the words themselves. Whatever the medium in which we think it is, it virtually by definition has to be unambiguous because surely the guy who wrote the headline knew what he meant, when, what he wanted to get across when he said Bundy beats date with chair. It's just that his, thought, his thoughts are more finely differentiated than the English language in this case. And to make things worse, even when, again, this is, uh, relates to why it's been so hard to program a computer to converse with us in English, even when stretches of language are unambiguous, they are usually only the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, what you have to know in order to interpret it. Um, words are actually just suggestions that call to mind uh, complex trains of thought that one has to interpolate in order to understand anything. Take another example. This is one of my uh, favorite passages in the English language. Wet hair, lather, rinse, repeat. <laughs> now, you all know what that means. You know that uh, lather means take the shampoo and put it in your hair, not take the shampoo and put it on your feet. You all know that the repeat part means uh, re start, starting from the lather part, you don't have to wet your hair again, even your hair is already wet, and so on. These are, um, all of these missing premises, these connections uh, between one bit 
string of words in another are essential for understanding, and they uh, obviously aren't expressed in the language itself. It's the um, infrastructure on which language rests. Finally, let's go back to, the, um, to those uh, uh, Eskimos with their 200 words for snow. Well, um, remember last winter there was a horrible winter with all the snow and all the magazines were writing articles on snow. I was very proud to be featured in an article in New York Magazine that uh, had to break two bits of sad news to people. One, it quoted a physicist who said, it is not true that no two snowflakes are alike. Isn't that sad? There are two snowflakes that are alike all the time. So that's snow myth number one debunked. <laughs> snow myth number two is that the Eskimos have 100, 200, 400 words for snow. If you go to an Eskimo English, English Eskimo dictionary, then again, depending on whether you have the unabridged dictionary or the cheap pocket dictionary, you'll find anywhere from between two and about 18 words for snow. Uh, English has about 13 words for snow, if you count as generously as you have to count in Eskimo in order to get these high figures. We've got hard pack, slush, blizzard, uh, uh, and a favorite of mine, which was coined by a local Boston area weatherman, snizzle, for a combination of snow and drizzle. Um, likewise, it turns out the Hopi have many concepts for time. There has been a, a practice for findings of small differences in anthropology to, uh, between one language and another to be exaggerated with each retelling so that every time it passes from the original report to the textbook to the magazine article to the column of amazing facts, the uh, figure doubles. And uh, that's, that has been what uh, linguists now call the great Eskimo vocabulary hoax. <laughs> now, let me turn now to how, how language works. What's behind this miraculous ability for me to talk about whatever, the sex life of the octopus and so on. How do we convey such a huge range of uh, thoughts by uh, these noises that come out of our mouths? I think in essence there are two tricks, two engineering principles behind human language. One of them is the principle of the word. And a word is an arbitrary pairing between a sound and a meaning. Uh, the Take the word duck, for example. The word duck doesn't look like a duck, or walk like a duck, or quack like a duck, but it conveys the concept duck because all of us have undergone uh, similar memorizations sometime in our childhood where we simply paired that word with that meaning. It could have been another word. It could have been canard if we were French speakers and so on. It happened to be duck, and we've all memorized it the same way. The we basically store these arbitrary pairings in a, in the, a mental dictionary. And the, one of the remarkable things about the mental dictionary is simply how large it is. Um, using dictionary sampling techniques, one can uh, estimate how large a uh, person's vocabulary is. And these techniques have shown that a typical um, a high school senior has a vocabulary of 60,000 words, um, and you thought their vocabulary was just cool and sucks. But no, this is not true. Uh, 60,000 arbitrary memorizations, each one as meaningless as a telephone number or the date of a treaty, and all the while that um, people, uh, children struggle for years to master something like the multiplication table, which has only 36 entries in it, and it takes years for them to learn it. Many of them never do. Uh, people are, these same children are acquiring words at a rate of one every 90 waking minutes starting at the age of one. So that's one of the remarkable facts about language and one source of its uh, amazing expressive power. But of course we don't just blurt out single words at each other. We combine them into phrases and sentences that convey the relationships among ideas. It's an old cliche in journalism that when a dog bites a man, that isn't news, but when a man bites a dog, that's news. Now, the reason that language can convey news, including unexpected events, is because it gives you rules like ordering subject, verb, and object that allow you to express who did what to whom for any who and any whom. Uh, as a result, the um, number of sentences 
possible sentences, each one corresponding to a different thought, grows exponentially with the length of the sentence. If there are 10 words it, that you can begin a sentence with and 10 words that you can follow that one with, then you've got 100 two-word sentences. And if there are 10 in the third position, then you've got 1,000 three-word sentences and so on. And there, this uh, arithmetic works out to there being uh, 100 million trillion different sentences of length 20 words or less, 20 words not being a particularly long sentence. But in fact, um, as if that wasn't impressive enough, one can make the, uh, one can say in it that in a formal sense, a language is not just really, 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 really big, but infinitely big. And now, how can you do that? If the days of our lives are three score and 10, how could anyone utter an infinitely long sentence? Well, obviously, no mere mortal could, but it's not because of the English language or any language. By the same argument that says that there are an infinite number of integers, namely, if you ever claim to have found the largest, I can always add one to it and come up with one that's even bigger, there is no such thing as the longest English sentence. Um, now, by the way, it just so happens that the Guinness Book of World Records has a category for the world's longest sentence, longest English sentence. It's 1,300 words long. It comes from a novel by William Faulkner. <laughs> and I won't reproduce all 1,300 words here, but it begins with the words, they both bore it as though in deliberate, flagellant exaltation, and goes on from there. However, this is not the world's longest English sentence. Um, I am tempted to gain immortality in Guinness by submitting the following. Faulkner wrote, they both bore it as though in deliberate flatulent <laughs> exaltation. But unfortunately, this would not be immortality, but only the proverbial 15 minutes of fame, because any one of you could submit. Pinker told me that Faulkner wrote, they both bore it as though in deliberate flagellant exaltation, dot, dot, dot. Um, let me conclude now by talking a bit about the future of languages and the future of language. The future of languages is not very bright. There are 6,000 languages being uh, spoken now on the planet. The exact number depends on whether you're a, a lumper or a splitter as far as dialect versus language is concerned. But I think there's a consensus that the number is between 4,000 and 6,000. Uh, in a century, there may be as few as 600, a 90% reduction. How do we know that? Easy. Language, as I've been emphasizing, is recreated each generation by children. If a linguist visits a tribe whose language is spoken only by grown-ups, one can therefore predict with high confidence that the language is doomed. Um, this is a, uh, a tragedy that is numerically far worse than the, uh, the horrible extinction of species that we're also witnessing. Uh, it's a tragedy for a number of reasons. One is simply that a language um, captures um, much of what is special in a culture. The songs and poetry obviously are gone when the language is gone. Language represents the collective genius of thousands of um, millions of speakers. All of the idioms, figures of speech, uh, neat words in a, a language are uh, really like a magnificent work of art. A language, languages often are the only evidence available to us for the history of peoples before history was written. How did the Chinese get into China? How did the Aborigines get to Australia? Many of those questions uh, can only be answered by looking at similarities between language families in different parts of the world. We know that the gypsies originally came from India because the language of the gypsies, Romani, is basically a, a dialect of, of uh, Hindi and other Indian languages. And uh, finally, linguistic diversity tells us a lot about the human mind. The, anything that manages to withstand the scrutiny of comparisons between languages, and, and it turns out to be universal, across all 6,000 languages tells us something important about the nature of the human mind that transcends the differences between the Yanomamo and the uh, Kung San and the Aborigines and us. And conversely, the differences between languages tell you how the language learning mechanism works. It tells you what can vary from locale to locale and be learned during the lifetime of a child. 
uh, there's no easy answer as to what can be done. Obviously, uh, many of us uh, no longer speak the language that our grandparents spoke, and um, the same reason that that uh, caused us to acquire the language of the majority is taking place all over the world. Probably the most important thing to do on sheer practical grounds uh, is simply to record the languages before they disappear, but then there are um, a very complicated set of ethical and political issues above and beyond that simple uh, scholarly goal. Um, however, the future of language itself is, I think, uh, quite secure. There are always Jeremiah's who are proclaiming the imminent doom of the language. Uh, people are using impact as a verb. There's the, the, you know, the hopefully, the, the kids are watching too much Beavis and Butthead. There are the valley girls and the computer hackers. And uh, everyone is polluting the language so that uh, if present trends continue, we'll all be um, like Tarzan and, uh, in, in a few decades. Now, you get a bit of perspective on this kind of complaint if, as I've mentioned, you look cross-culturally, if you look historically especially. Uh, no language stays put. That is one of the most certain things one can say about language. Uh, we, you and I, don't talk like Chaucer. And is it a terrible tragedy that we don't talk like Chaucer? Well, I don't think so. We seem to be doing just fine. And all the while, that the, at every stage in which English has changed uh, bit by bit from the language of Chaucer, there have been the, uh, the equivalent of the pundits and uh, Jeremiah saying that the language is doomed. And in the 1600s, they said no one will be able to talk by the 1700s. And in the 1700s, they said no one will be able to talk by the 1800s, and so on. But um, a lot of what are seen now as corruptions of the language are simply the ordinary process, which always takes place, no exceptions in any language, whereby new words, new constructions enter a language, old ones uh, begin, uh, gradually uh, disappear. A lot of the words that are uh, an unexceptionable part of English now began life as slang and were denounced in as uh, vituperative terms as people now denounce uh, impact or uh, the speech of the valley girls. Words like banter, sham, bully, mob, all of them were considered uh, horrible slang when they first uh, entered. Uh, my own attitude is that most slang terms will outlive their usefulness. I mean, now it would be absurd to talk about something as being really gear the way the Beatles did, but that every once in a while a term will uh, capture a concept for which there's no other word, and that's how the expressive range of a language uh, can grow. Uh, personally, I don't know what I ever did without the, the verb to dis and to blow off, and uh, I predict that those will be with us in uh, 50 years. So in general, I think that uh, despite local worries about uh, younger people speaking differently than we do, uh, language will be with us uh, for as long as there are human beings because language is the quintessential human instinct. Thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions? Yes. The question is, uh, uh, have I done any research on children with neuromuscular uh, impairments, such as children with cerebral palsy? I haven't um, done those studies myself, although I've, I'm very interested in them, and I have a former graduate student who's now a professor at Rutgers who's been um, studying them. It's of um, obvious practical importance. One always gets the sense in those cases that there is a, that the, it's simply an output problem. The children have been, uh, hearing language and have been picking it up just fine. They just can't get it out. And there's the technological uh, problem of providing them with some medium of communication that they can control with whatever residual motor abilities they have left. And the, the state of the art has gotten much better thanks to uh, inexpensive computers, but it's got a, a long way to go because most of the techniques are still 
point at a word, point at a canned phrase. And if I've been, if there's anything to emphasize about, emphasize about language, it's this creative, productive, combinatorial ability, which still is painfully slow for uh, people with severe uh, neuromuscular uh, disorders. Uh, the hope is that, the, um, uh, that those techniques will improve uh, by a lot as both computer technology and um, surgical techniques improve. It's also of great theoretical interest um, to me simply because there's the question of when children acquire a language, how much uh, role does speaking and getting feedback play? I think it, based on my s studies of uh, ordinary children learning spoken language, I've always suspected that it doesn't play much of a role, that most of language learning is driven, in the child, is driven by hearing sentences in context. Parents usually don't correct their children during the years in which they're acquiring language. The corrections almost always have to do with these prescriptive rules that I uh, was poo-pooing before. Don't say me and Jennifer are going to the mall. Say Jennifer and I are going to the mall. Those so peripheral frills. And in fact, um, the uh, former student that I spoke about, Professor Karen Stromswald at Rutgers, in um, using subtle tests of comprehension has found that at least uh, one case study of a boy who had no speech output uh, turned out that he was able to make very precise distinctions between sentences with uh, different grammatical constructions, even though he had never spoken a word in his life. Pardon me? How was he able to do that? Oh, how, how did he? How did he show it to her? Oh, he, she would say things like, um, "Oh, uh, point to." There's a picture of um, the dog that is chased by the cat, uh, bit the giraffe, and another. Uh, and there are two pictures, one of which. The dog is biting the giraffe, the other one, the cat is biting the giraffe, and so on. And you, the child has to point to the picture that corresponds to the sentence. So that would be one way uh, where the response is simply pointing, but unless you've parsed the sentence mentally in the right way, you will be at chance in choosing which of the two pictures uh, is appropriate. Yes? Yes, you started too late. Uh, the, um, it, the children, th this, the ability that I spoke of, the, the language instinct, the ability to acquire a language is something that does uh, change with age. You can measure a decline starting even at the age of six, and then it really drops off uh, around puberty or a year or two afterwards. After puberty, it's virtually impossible to acquire a foreign language without an accent, and um, it's even difficult to acquire a lot of the fine points of grammar. Again, by fine points, I don't mean the split infinitives. By fine points, I mean things like when you use an article, when you stick an S onto the verb to have it agree with the subject. Um, so uh, no one knows for sure why this decline occurs. My hunch is that it literally reflects changes in the brain. The, um, a two-year-old has 50% more connections between brain cells than an adult has. Basically, it's all downhill from the age of two. Uh, <laughs> and um, there, basically, it's, uh, for an adult, it's, you, we've got to make do using a lot of crutches. We've got to treat learning a second language like um, any other intellectual problem, like calculus or history, uh, immersing yourself in a culture so that you have to use it, the, the tapes, the conjugation exercises, basically anything that helps uh, we have to rely on, unlike the child where it, it just happens. So any immigrant knows that the child, um, while they're struggling at the, uh, at the Y with night classes, their children pick up English from the playground so quickly that they make fun of their parents' grammatical errors. Yes? Is the question is, is, is a more advanced language more economical? Um, no, in fact, it's not. I don't think there's any meaningful sense in which there is such a thing as a more advanced language. Um, and languages are always, it depends, languages are so complex that they are often economical in one area and uneconomical in another. And it's almost impossible to compare two languages across the board. Uh, English, for example, even within English, we've got in the, uh, among the verbs, there are 180 irregular verbs in English, but they're irregular for the past tense. Ring, rang, bring, brought, come, came, go, went. 
for the rule that adds ing, 100% of English verbs are regular. Coming, going, being, seeing, taking, etc. So even within the language, it's economical here, wasteful there. And when you start to compare several languages, again, it depends on what you look at. You can almost always point to something in one language that's one, more economical, but then something else that it might go the other way around. Yes? Right. The question is, is there some uh, ambiguity or contradiction in saying that um, it's a, a tragedy for these languages to be going extinct at the same time I'm saying that there's nothing wrong with English changing and absorbing new words? Would that be a fair way of summarizing the question? Yeah, it's, it's really a matter of degree. It certainly is a good point that English is going to go extinct in the sense that a yeah, thousand years from now, you can bet that they're not going to be talking the same English that we're talking now. Um, the, it's really a matter of degree, but a very strong matter of degree, in that these, these are languages that just you know, vanish, bang like that. Uh, the last speaker dies and it's gone forever, whereas something like the changes that English is undergoing are so gradual that we have a very rich record and uh, good preservation of uh, much of the um, language from generation to generation. Of course, there's a lot of the beauty of English that, that has gone forever from us. I mean, there's a, that's why there are Chaucer scholars and, for that matter, Shakespeare scholars. But uh, the, the point is well taken. We, we're not even going to preserve English, but it's a really a matter of degree. Yes? Um, the question is, does language become more efficient as, as time passes? Uh, the answer is in some ways yes, in other ways no. Um, in, w there are processes like reduction of words in length. Anything you've got to use a lot, you um, find a short word for. That's why we say TV instead of television, fridge instead of refrigerator, uh, and so on. Um, there's Reduction and erosion and slurring, are the irregular past tense form made, for example, was a reduction of maked. Uh, on the other hand, some things get more complicated. They get more complicated either because um, people reanalyze speech. Uh, uh, an example is the, the recent expression, uh, oh, a whole nother thing, which comes from uh, the ambiguity of the word another. Another can either be an other or a another. They sound the same. And it's really a question of where your brain puts the white space in between the sounds. If uh, enough people are, uh, if it occurs to enough people to put the white space, say, between the ah uh, and the another, then even though they, you can't hear the difference for that expression, as soon as you start using it in other constructions, that you can stick a word between them and get a whole other thing. And that's an area in which language maybe is a little more complicated. So when you look at the history of a language, you find that basically, things are happening all over the place. Some places the word meanings are changing, the grammar changes more slowly, of course, than the word meanings. Um, things get, start to get slurred as people are lazy, but then on the other hand, if you get too lazy, no one will be able to understand you, so you start to invent new distinctions and new vowels and consonants to um, make, make yourself even more clear. The, the, um, the, the, uh, sort of surfer dialect of, of uh, Jeff Spicoli from Made Famous in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, the sort of, hey, dude, um, is a case where you've got a vowel that's currently gotten much more complex and requires more effort to articulate. And so it, language tends to stay at more or less an equilibrium of complexity, but each part is, uh, drifts in one direction or another. Yes?
both. Um, uh, the question is, when I talk about a language instinct, am I talking about brain wiring or am I talking about an adaptive tool? I'm talking about an, ad an adaptive tool that we have by virtue of brain wiring. That is, it was adaptive not just to each of us uh, and therefore useful to learn, but it was adaptive through long enough of our evolutionary history that the people with uh, mutations that changed their brain wiring in such a way that nat language came to them more easily had a selective advantage. And as that was repeated over many generations, the brain became, uh, in some sense, wired for language. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, the question is, uh, according to my definition, does, uh, do animals have language, and if not, how do you distinguish between animal communication and human language? Um, it's, I don't think it's a particularly meaningful question, because uh, whether animals have language, precisely for the reason that you articulated, namely according to my definition, um, whether you want to call animal communication language or not simply depends on how you want to use the word language. I think there is a, um, a, a, uh, a different way that I would put it. Namely, uh, if you'll forgive the, uh, the jargon word, are uh, animal communication systems homologous to human language? I think that's a meaningful question. Homology in, uh, in, in biology means, in some sense, biologically the same thing, the same because it descended from uh, a single system and a common ancestor. So for example, the, a human arm and uh, a bat's wing and a horse's front leg are all homologous, even though they do different things, because they all came from the forelimb of the common ancestor of the human uh, horse and bat. Whereas the wing of a bat and the wing of a butterfly, even though they do the same thing, are not homologous, they're merely analogous. That is, one can see similarities between them, but the similarities are not um, don't apply that they're biologically the same system, the same organ. So there's some, now in the case of human language, there's some things that are uh, common to human language and other animals, say vocalizations, some of the motor control of the mouth and tongue and so on. But, um, and there are, animals can communicate various kinds of messages. Uh, some chimps can be taught to associate signs with uh, uh, their concepts. But the question is, are they, doing, are they using the same mental organ, the same biological system as we do? And I think the answer is no. The, um, for one thing, um, there's something very special about human language that you don't even find an analog to in the animal kingdom. We, um, animal communication systems are virtually all either uh, a choice from a fixed repertoire. Uh, there's a finite list of signals and uh, you know, 25 different calls in a monkey, and the monkey chooses from among them. Sort of like those Barney dolls where you, you, you uh, press the hand and a canned message comes out. Or sometimes they're, um, they vary in an analog way. The louder the yell, the more fear the animal is, expresses, kind of like the mercury in a thermometer. But what you, you don't see is a grammatical combination where, depending on the arrangement of the signals, predictably different messages are conveyed. The man bites dog versus dog bites man. That, um, despite claims uh, to the contrary, I don't think has even been really mastered by chimpanzees. And even what chimpanzees do master differs very strikingly from human language in that you need a bunch of psychologists hell-bent on getting the chimps to, to, to talk, whereas for human children, all you have to do is bring them up with other human beings around and they do it spontaneously in this sequence that I mentioned. So yes, animals communicate. Uh, yes, there are similarities between animal, animal communication and human language. Whether you want to call it language or not depends on what you would think the word language should mean. Are animal communication systems biologically uh, related to human language? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I think, b uh, by the way, other kinds of human communication clearly are. Are moans, laughter, sighs, uh, cooing, and so on are clearly homologous to communication in, in um, other primates. Uh, 
by just our language. It's actually controlled by different, <coughs> excuse me, a different part of the brain than moans and cries and shrieks and so on. Seems to have evolved uh, after the split between humans and chimps. I think. Yes. Yeah, is the, the question is, is there, are there sociological reasons why all these languages are going extinct? And there clearly are, and it's a good question because it, it is only sociological factors. It's not, I sometimes get asked, well, doesn't this prove the superiority of the English language, uh, that it can survive and all these others are going extinct, there must be something wrong with them. But um, that, that's quite clearly not true. Um, it's because of the, of mass media, uh, you know, the, you, you get CNN, and uh, you want to understand what's going on. It's only the old fogies who speak, you know, inuktitut. Uh, if I want to uh, you know, understand what they're saying in the rock videos and get a job with the government, I better learn English. Um, some of the same forces that cause uh, people like me not to speak Yiddish, though my grandparents did. Um, often more <clears throat> nefarious events like genocide like uh, uh, destruction of habitats of peoples, uh, a large set of factors like that. Yeah. Yes? Uh, the question is, is our reliance on pictures since uh, the advent of television causing some, um, uh, how did you refer to it, some um, decline, deterioration of the language? Um, no, I don't think so. I think people, the language change and richness of language comes from people, people sitting around schmoozing over coffee, um, boasting and gossiping and um, human interaction that takes place no matter how much television you watch. Um, I think there is, uh, there is reason to be concerned about um, literacy, about people's ability to read, people's ability to compose prose, but in terms of the English language, its stock of constructions, its vocabulary and so on, um, I don't think television is uh, eating into that. It's not even eating into accents, really. I mean, people all think that, um, often think, well, gee, if Tom Brokaw is being broadcast into every home, isn't the southern accent going to disappear, the uh, uh, Arkansas accent, and so on? Um, in fact, the, remarkably, that hasn't, even that hasn't happened. Um, people don't learn language, including their accent, from television. Language is really a face-to-face uh, -face social encounter, and that's really where it, um, what drives it, I think. Yes? Yeah, uh, an excellent question. The question was, um, there, there was a study that got a lot of press last week that was published in Nature on a, um, <clears throat> a neuroimaging study of men and women um, doing various tasks like deciding whether two words rhymed uh, or whether two words were uh, written in the same sequence of uh, big uppercase and lowercase letters, a variety of tasks like that. This is a study in which people were, uh, their heads were stuck in a um, an MRI machine, and with some fancy new algorithms and wiring, you can get an MRI machine to tell you what parts of the brain are uh, using more oxygen, basically what parts of your brain are thinking harder. And um, the finding was that in, in um, one of the tasks, deciding whether two words rhymed, there was um, males had a much more activation in the left hemisphere than the right. For females, it was 50-50. Uh, it was equal. And the conclusion was men's and women's brains are wired completely differently, and the question expressed some uh, skepticism about that, or at least asked if there was an alternative. Um, those of you who read the article um, in the Associated Press version of, that, of the 
write-up will might remember that in the last paragraph they quoted uh, some uh, stick-in-the-mud grump who uh, questioned the importance of this finding. Um, the stick-in-the-mud grump was me, and um, for for precisely the, the reasons it's um, the, that the question alluded to. Um, I think it's it, it's the it, neuroimaging is a brand new field, and let's put it this way: they haven't gotten all the bugs out. If you look at the history of all of these stories that have appeared in the press over the last few years, they're mutually contradictory and contradict 100 years of neurological studies of language, and no one bothers to point this out. And indeed, the um, claim that women's brains are organized to be perfectly symmetrical for language is simply preposterous, given what we know of uh, the effects of brain damage on um, language abilities. There's a grain of truth in that women are a little less lopsided than men. If you're going to have a stroke to your the parasylvian region of your brain uh, on the left side, then you should definitely be a woman because you'll, your, your uh, aphasia will be less severe. And this suggests that there is somewhat um, different distribution in female brains. But the idea that, that women are completely symmetrical, which is what the claim of the study was, uh, I, is, uh, can't be sustained given the entire body of scientific evidence as opposed to this little, uh, this single study. Uh, it is, I, I think that the authors hadn't ruled out the possibility that there was a difference in strategy between, as opposed to a difference in hard wiring. There are lots of, there, there's more than one way to skin a cat, and there's more than one way to decide whether two words, for example, have the same sequence of big letters and little letters. One of them is saying the letters to yourself, you know, big, little, big, big, little, little, big, which if women use that a little bit more often than men do, then when you subtract that task from the one in which they were deciding whether two things rhymed, you could get that pattern of difference as a, a byproduct. Um, so there's the tiny grain of truth that, that men are more lopsided than women, but the, I thought the, the, at least the press version of that uh, initial study was way too strong. Yes? Uh, do, do I see the, pop, the possibility of new languages? Yes. Um, no, the most dramatic case would be Nicaraguan sign language. But um, for a new language to develop, basically a um, group of people has to be isolated in some way, splinter off from a larger population, either geographically, they go out and they live on an island, uh, they cross a mountain range and never go back, or um, so, sociologically, they live in uh, an underclass that never talks to the uh, other class. Since all languages change, there you develop, you know, new words, new acts, new <clears throat> ways of slurring your speech that become standardized. Time passes, and the languages will differentiate. It's certainly the not the dominant trend. The dominant trend is way in the other direction, but it is uh, possible. Um, it's possible often after political uh, upheavals and, and invasions when um, there'll be a, a new language that'll be imposed on a population, but they have imperfect access to it. They just don't, don't fraternize with the conquerors enough to get the pure version of the language, but have to make do with what they can um, get traces of. Then when they use it with their kids, the kids creolize it into a full-fledged language. There are also cases like modern Hebrew where um, the, for political reasons, the, uh, uh, the colony in Palestine decided, under the influence of a small number of influential people, that they were a crazy idea at the time to revive this dead la biblical language and use it to talk about you know, microscopes and tractors and, and Marxism and so on. Um, but uh, the fact, th this is one of my favorite examples of how um, it's, of how language, in the interplay between language and expressing thoughts. It's the thoughts that drive the language. If you're stuck with a language that doesn't give you the means of talking about dialectical materialism or how refrigerators work, you don't cease to think about those concepts. You just change the language. You do what, what uh, the uh, uh, Palestine Jews did with Hebrew. Yes? The question is, is, is there evidence that if you're brought up with several languages as a child, then 
when you acquire new ones as an adult, are you more likely to learn it without an accent? Um, I think you're, in general, you'll still have an accent, although you'll do much, you'll do better at learning the language. It, I, I, it, I should add that it depends on the relationship between the languages you learned as a child and the one you have to learn as an adult. If it's you learn Spanish when you're a child and then you learn Portuguese when you're an adult, it's different than if you learn Spanish and then you have to learn, say, Chinese, something like that. But there is some, some uh, grain of truth in that, yeah. Yes? Yes, is there any, has there been any progress in discovering how individual languages came about? Well, it's a question of how far back you go, and a great deal is known about how all of the languages of Europe and Western Asia came about. This was uh, the um, discovery of, of uh, Indo-European family and the Proto-Indo-European language that they're all thought to be descended from, and that gives you a pretty, we have a pretty good understanding uh, of, uh, over a range of the last, say, uh, 5,000, maybe 8,000 years for the, that family of languages. Likewise, in other language families, if we can, uh, linguists can pretty well trace how they diverge from another, usually following the splitting of a people into two groups which uh, got out of touch with one another and their language changes got out of sync, eventually resulting in new, new languages. For languages of um, uh, mi the Middle East and Northern Africa, the, the uh, um, Semitic and Hamitic languages, what linguists now call Afro-Asiatic family, for the languages of, of uh, much of Africa, and so on. And many of you may have heard um, this a new wave of uh, scholars trying to go back even farther. Um, and rather than going back, say, 5,000, maybe 8,000 years, try to go back 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, even 100,000 years to families that characterize, say, all of um, uh, Europe and Southern Asia or even the entire world. These, some of this has been done by expatriate um, uh, Russian linguists uh, out of the mainstream of American and British linguistics and by a few isolated fans. Most linguists, um, most for, for what it's worth, most linguists think that these other efforts are uh, flaky, that they are, um, that there's, uh, um, they're not being done according to the standards that have led us to um, reconstruct, say, the Proto-Indo-European language family, but are much more loosey-goosey in terms of what kind of evidence they'll accept. So um, you look at some words in one language, you learn a, look at some words in another language, you observe some resemblances and you say, ah, those languages must have originally been the same language. The problem is that you can get lots of coincidences if you just compare two languages haphazardly. It just so happens that there's an Australian Aboriginal language in which the word for dog is dog. Just a coincidence, but these coincidences can happen if you're only forming words out of 40 or so vowels and consonants. Also, there's borrowings. I mean, you could, it would be, um, it, it, one could spuriously say that uh, England and English and French must have been the same language recently because words like garage and machine and negligee and cafe uh, are in both languages. That's because they were very recently borrowed. And so these studies that you've, uh, you may have heard about from NOVA and Scientific American and, and um, US News and Report, World Report have those problems. This isn't to say that they're wrong, by the way. I think with good statistics, one could get a baseline of how many correspondences one would expect by chance and compare the number that you observe against that baseline. But, um, and one, one of these days, some statistician will become famous by figuring out how to do that properly. But for now, we're, we, we are pretty good with a time window of about 5,000 years older than that. Um, we really don't know. Yes? By the uh, woman with the light shirt. Like, like uh, different dialects of English, like Black English, and so on. I would, um, I, I don't know of precise studies, but I would guess simply 
looking at, say, differences between acquisition of English and you know, German, Russian, Dutch, and so on, the schedule is pretty similar for all languages. So I would guess that it would, it would uh, work pretty much the same way for non-standard dialects of English. Uh, remember that kids learning standard English aren't learning it from written sources, so they are learning it from whatever their parents happen to speak, and I imagine that's the way it works for non-standard English as well. Yes? Given, uh, I'm sorry, that we will live to 120, 125? Do you expect to live to 120 or 25? <laughs> Uh, that is, will Chinese become the, um, the, the world's language? So I'm sorry, is the question of whether Chinese will become the lingua franca of the earth or? Oh, I see. If you, that is, if you think that um, by the time they reach 100, they'll need Chinese, should you start before their brains change? Yes, 30, 40. It's certainly, um, it's certainly true that if you, there, there's a, it's certainly true that if you're going to need a language, you should learn it young. That is definitely true. Um, the problem is, as probably a number of people in this room can attest, you can know a language very well when you're a child and then lose it virtually completely if you don't, uh, if you don't keep it up. Um, so that's, that would be the main problem, I think. Yes? Yeah, the question is about the relation between language and memory. For example, is the reason that we don't have uh, memories uh, below a certain age because we didn't have language at that age. I think probably the consensus is that that's not the explanation. That um, you have, uh, that memories come in in a kind of predictable fashion. Most people have a uh, memory of a few isolated scenes, usually in great perceptual detail, from, but with no connection to one another, starting about the age of two. You might remember yourself in, in you know, pajamas with feet or remember seeing adults doing something. And they're very, um, they have this Proustian quality of having a, a lot of sensory detail, but uh, even, they often come before there was much language and, uh, uh, and often um, it takes work to put them into words. I don't think they're linguistic in, in form. Then starting around the age of three or four, that's when you have a, the beginning of continuous autobiographical memory. That's the age at which, if your parents suddenly said, you know, you had a brother that died at when you were such and such an age, at a certain point, you wouldn't believe them. At a certain point, you'd have to take their word for it. Starting around the age of four, if you were told, or we lived in a different city or a different house and, and so on, um, your memory is continuous to that point, so it doesn't tolerate any radical intrusions. Um, and there are, are well, fairly well-known changes in the brain systems that underlie memory that change maturationally, just the same way that at a certain age, teeth come out. And um, I think those are thought to be responsible for uh, the childhood amnesia. I actually had someone write in to me who said that her daughter uh, actually said, blurted out at the age of three or something, uh, something like, oh yeah, I, I remember that and I wanted to tell you about it, but I couldn't talk then. Uh, now. You know, it's it's an anecdote. You don't know whether to take the child at f uh, what the child said at face value, but I do actually take it at face value. I think that that's that was you can't. It's not scientific evidence, but my hunch is that the child was speaking uh, sincerely. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes, uh, it, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question, and it's, the question is, uh, where did the pairing between sounds and words originally come from? And we know a lot about where 
rock came from in the sense that, oh yeah, it came from such and such a word in Germanic, which came from such and such a word in Proto-Indo-European, and then you would have a right to say, yeah, but what gave the Proto-Indo-Europeans the idea of calling it that? And um, it's, uh, no one knows. And uh, it's, ideally what we'd like to do is have uh, a group of kids well taken care of on the proverbial desert island and see what they come up with and see how, they, how something like that catches on. There have been a number of fanciful suggestions like that um, you imitate with your tongue the motion of the thing that, that um, uh, you're trying to coin a word for. It's called the ding-dong theory because your tongue moves like the clapper of a bell. Uh, and there's not much evidence for them. There's some degree of non-arbitrariness in the relation between huge fields of, of things and huge fields of words, like in, in this is called phonetic symbolism. In general, things with vowels like e and i tend to denote small things, and things with vowels that uh, in the, where your tongue is farther back and lower in your mouth, like a ah and o, tend to stand for big things. So you've got tweeters and woofers, you've got uh, things that are teensy and things that are humongous. Uh, and so on, but that doesn't, it's not specific enough to actually call that a glorp. And how um, a group of ancestors agreed among themselves to call it a glorp is something we've never been able to uh, say anything intelligent about. Yes? You can, um, it's a good question. How do you, uh, first of all, is there a contradiction in saying that the, um, uh, the, the self-described language mavens are really uh, kibitzers uh, who have no particular authority on what's correct and saying that children should learn the, the standard and is there, is it possible to learn to write the standard if you don't speak the standard? Um, I think that there, I think there are arguments for having a standard and having it, uh, be taught in schools, but not only in writing, uh, as a second language, so to speak. You can be, just as you can be bilingual, you can be bi-dialectal. And in fact, probably a lot of people in this room are bi-dialectal in the sense that when they talk to uh, their, their uh, parents or even their pals out of school, the speech style is extremely different from uh, in a formal setting. Uh, often people can assume different accents when they talk to their mother or when they talk to their friends. It's really, and that's kind of a matter of degree from just having more of a New York accent when you talk to your mother than when you uh, uh, talk in public, uh, ranging from having two similar dialects like black English or standard English or rural American English and standard English to having English and Dutch. I think the mind is capable of having co juggling to uh, many f forms of speech uh, all at the same time without loss. But it, it's true that I don't think you could be a good, uh, a very good writer uh, of uh, English unless you were able to command it uh, conversationally. I think that the, I guess the, to resolve the contradiction, I think that, um, you know, unlike some radicals and romantics of the 60s who say, you know, kids should just, you know, be liberated, they should talk however they want, uh, composition classes are a form of oppression of, and so on. Um, I, I, mean, I think I would be, it would be hypocritical for me to say that because, I mean, you bet when I get term papers, I pull out my red pen and, and correct the punctuation and so on. Um, it's just important to first realize what that is. It's not teaching kids to speak grammatically. It's teaching them to speak standard English. And teaching sta uh, speaking standard English is important, but it's not the same as speaking grammatically. And also to treat standard English as a, um, something to be discovered from the way the, from, from cultivating a fine ear, observing how people consistently express themselves, especially people who take care with their language, and not to assume that just because it was in the 
uh, just because your English teacher taught it to you because her English teacher taught it to her because his, her, his English teacher taught it to him and so on, that it has to be followed. These things can be challenged and discussed intelligently and treated as things that we make discoveries about rather than as, um, you know, as edicts from an academy. Even the French Academy is uh, kind of a joke in France. Okay, and we have time for one more question. Yes? Yes, the question is, do hearing children of deaf parents babble, and, uh, babble in speech, and do they babble uh, in sign? <clears throat> the answer is they, they begin, yes, they do babble in speech, and uh, they also babble with their hands. Uh, babbling with speech uh, is primarily done not as imitation of the parents, but um, to basically to hear yourself uh, wiggle, what happens when you wiggle your mouth and tongue. However, the, it does change and um, declines in, uh, as the child gets older. If the child is not around anyone else who's speaking, the babbling gets simpler and disappears uh, in, for a hearing child of deaf parents, whereas for a hearing child of hearing parents, it tends to start sounding more and more like the language that the parents are speaking. So it starts off the same and then eventually diverges. And um, the psychologist Laura Petito recently showed that um, ch um, children of signing parents will make rhythmic gestures with their hands that are in some way like uh, sign gestures, presumably to watch their hands so that they are later equipped to approximate the actual signs in the same way that hearing children babble to first learn how to make noise of a specified type to, as a prerequisite to later matching the noises coming out of their parents' mouths. Okay, I think we'd better call it a night. Thank you very much.